My name is Monk Rowe and I'm filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive today in San Francisco. I'm very pleased to have mm -hmm. Earl Watkins with me. Uh, my you know, pleasure. And uh, your name seems to be synonymous with music mm -hmm. here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. As I discovered in, in talking to a number of people out here on the phone, they always mention your name. Mm -hmm. you better talk to Earl, they said. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to be here. and I. Um, I have a feeling that San Francisco's has changed a lot since it, your youth. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm a native of born San Franciscan. I was born in uh, 1920, January the 29th. And there have been many, many, many changes. The, everything, our skyline has changed. It's, we're being Manhattanized. Uh, our transportation system, which used to be the best in the country, we're having problems with it. We went from, from all electric streetcars and cable cars mm -hmm. then we went to buses and we do have we have light rail now but uh, uh, it's it's in trouble <laughs> our municipal railway uh, we have a a, a a an underground which we never had before uh, then we have of course the bart the bart mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, yeah of course um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have both, we have two bridges, which we didn't have before. When I was growing up, we had uh, ferry boats. We, yeah, we rode the ferry. There was a ferry to Sausalito, there was a ferry to Oakland, there was a ferry to Berkeley, and there was a ferry that ran uh, to uh, Richmond, and from Richmond there was a ferry that ran over to San Rafael. So now we have the Golden Gate Bridge, which uh, leads you into Marin County. We have the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Oakland. Then we have another bridge from Richmond to uh, San Rafael, the uh, Richmond-San Rafael Bridge. And now also we have uh, a San Mateo Bridge. That's a bridge uh, from oh, Hayward to uh, San Mateo. But that bridge I think that's been there for as long as I can remember that's been there. Then they have another one they call the Dunbarton, Dunbarton Bridge. And it uh, runs, uh, you go further south on uh, uh, past Hayward uh, on the, um, and it, oh, it's down near Mountain View. And then you, you cross over and it's more, I guess it's more like a, a land bridge more than, than up over the, the water. So uh, uh, the the uh, now also um, we have different districts here. We have the uh, well naturally downtown uh, Knob Hill. Uh, we have the uh, South of Market. You've got the Western Edition. That's where I grew up. Then you've got the Richmond District. That's uh, going out to the beach, say from Presidio Avenue west, and that's on the north side of Geary Boulevard. Then you have the, um, the Sunset District. Now the Sunset District would be beyond our De Young Museum in the park. So that would be going west and on the opposite side of the park, the south side of the park all of that area. Now that area when I was growing up was sand dunes. Oh. They had sand dunes, you, you had streets, but, and, but you had sand dunes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you'd uh, take people out, to, if you were gonna teach someone how to drive a vehicle, oh. you'd take them out there to the sand dunes. So if the car got out of control, why there would be no damage. Nice. Uh, of course, after World War II, then there was this big uh, building boom and so this fellow, a Dolger, he uh, built, oh, he, he developed the um, Sunset and, and uh, also um, the area where San Francisco State is, Stonestown, Daly City. So there's, uh, there's just been all kinds of change. And of course our population, the population, yeah. and oh, it's uh, not necessarily San Francisco, although we've had a big increase here, but the uh, Bay Area, See, because now uh, San Francisco is very small. We're like on the tip of the peninsula, and we can only right. go. You can only go so far. Yeah, you can only <laughs> go up, like <laughs> New York. Huh? But uh, 
uh, there had been and the and the traffic. Now before, when I was growing up, very few people had cars. There are very few of the people that that, that I knew and my family knew. Uh, the, and also, the uh, people who were considered to be the the business people, maybe corporate owners at that mm -hmm. time, uh, they had chauffeurs. Chauffeurs was oh. a big thing. And my dad was a chauffeur. I see. Yeah, and that was considered to be a pretty good job. I was going to ask what what your parents uh, yeah, did yeah. for a living. Yeah, my mother was. She was a housewife. She mm -hmm. stayed home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what happened? Uh, uh, see, the um, most of the chauffeurs then they they hired colored chauffeurs. It was a large percentage of the uh, chauffeurs were colored chauffeurs. That was considered a good job. In later years. Uh, Oh, especially during the depression, the what happened? They um, a lot of uh, Oriental people came in, Japanese, and they would hire the the wife, husband and wife. They would stay on the premises. Uh, the wife would do the cooking and the house cleaning, and the mm -hmm. husband would do the gardening and and the general cleanup, butlering, and chauffeur. Oh. So that uh, yeah, that was during the depression. So this. Uh, African American chauffeurs found themselves out of work. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, that's, uh, but um, now, um, uh, and also during uh, before the war and during the Depression, our black uh, or African American population was comparatively small. I think the uh, different statistics I've read place it around five thousand people. Mm -hmm. So you knew you knew a lot of the people, some by name, some just by seeing them in the in a district where you lived or in your travels, mm -hmm. bumping into different people, seeing familiar faces, and then of course, uh, uh, the uh, if, as a kid, the adults knew you. You couldn't get away with anything <laughs> because they, yeah. the adults they would admonish you. Many times on the spot, or else when you got home, uh -huh. the telephone had rung, and so you know we had to be on our best behavior. Um, but uh, so, and most of us, most of the uh, uh, African American population <coughs> lived in the Western Edition. We had a few that lived out on the avenues, a few lived out in the Mission District, a few in the Marina, but in the main, they lived in uh, the Western Edition. So when the um, and all, we all went to school, and the schools were uh, mixed, integrated, so you had a chance to get a good education. Uh, and so uh, during the war, why, uh, there was a migration of the people, and, and they needed them for, because they, the war, uh, war industry sprung up practically overnight. And the Bay Area, oh man, we were we had all sorts of industries uh, scattered out through the whole Bay Area. Kaiser Shipbuilding, the, there was steel, I've forgotten the name, steel companies, machine shops. Oh, they were just all sorts of, uh, 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 of uh, businesses uh, that were contracted to yeah. help with the uh, the war effort. Now, uh, uh, I worked at the Navy Supply Depot. See, before I went into service, uh, uh, when that opened up, and, and then also when I went into service, they put us on leave immediately. So I went to work at a valve company that made valves, mm -hmm. and they were, uh, I don't know whether they were for the ships or for the tanks, but you know, they made valves. I did that for about two months before I got called to active okay. duty. Uh, Can I ask how old you were when uh, when you got called up? I was uh, 22. Uh -huh. Yeah, 22 years old. I was. That was. Uh, let's see. They, around June or July, the um, Navy sent a chief musician out to our union meetings. See, we used to have separate union meetings. Mm -hmm. so black union. We we would meet in Oakland at the Elks. Uh, Elks building there. They had a building with a bar and upstairs, and it was a it was a, quite a building, a very nice building, and we would hold our meetings there because uh, we were a subsidiary, and uh, we weren't uh, allowed access to the local six uh, musicians' headquarters. So, but anyhow, you know, the Navy they sent a chief out 
to recruit, to recruit black musicians to be stationed on the shore, sh given shore duty. Mm -hmm. So it was an offer you couldn't refuse, because yeah. I was 1A, and uh, so... Uh, in, uh, in, you, in your head, were you thinking, uh, it's this or perhaps the infantry? Oh yeah, yeah. That's what we were. We were all thinking that. Right. Everybody was thinking, you know, out there in the, in the mud, in the trenches, you yeah. know what? And we were all thinking that. And also, this was a chance. I was pretty raw, very raw as a musician. I had only been in the local, joining in '37, so I'd been in the local like five years, and uh, uh, my uh, experience. I was kind of limited, you know. I had mm -hmm. done little dance jobs, playing with small groups. Right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so we'll probably get around to that uh, as we go through yeah. my musical history. But uh, so I jumped at the chance, and it was a godsend because in that band you had a lot of real stalwarts and real artists. You had. Marshall Royal was our musical director, and Marshall ended up being the lead alto player for Count Basie, and then when he left Count Basie, he did studio work in Los Angeles, and he was one of the most sought after uh, lead alto players mm -hmm. uh, in, in the country. His brother Ernie Royal, outstanding trumpet player who ended up in New York doing studio work, but they all, uh, they were with the original Lionel Hampton band, the band that, uh, 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 made flying home. Yeah. Uh, Vernon Alley, of course, Mr. Music. Uh, he was in the, in the band. Wilbert Barranco, who's mentioned in the Leonard Feather, who was a very fine musician, uh, pianist, singer, and arranger. Wilbert, uh, during the WPA days, he had uh, been connected with the Music Project uh, in San Francisco, and he wrote for everything: orchestra, voices, strings, and prior to that. Uh, he had been on the road with, uh, um, oh, what the heck? Uh, the name slips, but it'll, oh, it'll, it'll come okay. to me in a moment. Uh, but Wilbur was very, very fine a pianist and arranger. Then we had uh, uh, Ernie Royal, we had Herman Grimes, fine trumpet player who had played in Los Angeles with Les Height and some of the other bands, Ike Bell out of Kansas City who grew up with Basie and all the Kansas City bunch, uh, trombones, Dan Hamilton, Frazier Scott, and uh, 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 Ralph Bledsoe, who was a very, very fine arranger and trombonist. He uh, later became a, a dentist. Then the saxophones, you had Curtis Lowe, baritone, uh, Curtis uh, uh, and I, well, we knew one another, like I say, from, from 1937. Curtis later, uh, after the Navy band, we worked together around here, and then he left, he went with Lionel Hampton, and then uh, he was back and forth with Lionel Hampton. Curtis ended up working at the Musicians' Union as an, uh, at our local 669 as the secretary. Then when we merged, he was given a job as assistant to Local 6. And they welcomed him because of he, he, he had gained so much knowledge, the Federation mm -hmm. rules and all, and, yeah. uh, and oh, he, he was a marvel with, with the weight scales and things. Oh. Uh, so then we had <coughs> Q. Dellis Martin. Q played the tenor sax, clarinet, and uh, uh, arranged. He had been with the Les Height Band in Los Angeles and also with the Benny Carter Band. And uh, Q, he would write arrangements. He could write arrangements just like you were writing a letter. Uh. Then we had uh, Jerome Richardson. He oh, was sure. on the alto and flute. And uh, then we had Jackie Kelson. Jack Kelson. He's now the lead alto player with the with the new bassy band. Sure. Yeah, Jack That's Kelson. Right. And we had Andy Anderson on uh, tenor sax. Andy was from. Uh, Cleveland, very fine uh, saxophone player. He never didn't achieve uh, uh, any really notoriety or, or uh, he didn't become a big name, but he was an outstanding player. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is our naval pre-flight band. Benny Sexton played the guitar, excellent guitarist, and I already mentioned Vernon on the bass. Uh, uh, <coughs> then we had uh, Buddy Colette, 
Buddy Colette was in the band, and Marshall wanted him to uh, uh, be in, in the number one dance band, but Buddy declined. And so um, uh, what happened? Out of the 45 men, Marshall took the cream. <laughs> so Buddy took the other guys, you know, and whipped them into a band. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, we were the rhythm bombardiers, and I've forgotten for the moment what Buddy called his band. Anyhow, he he whipped them into 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 such good shape that they would go out and play for dances at the USO and the various places, mm -hmm. just like we would, you know, as the, with the number one band. But uh, they they were there. They were the names, you know, and and people who went on to to further, uh, you know, become further, uh, what in their career. We had uh, we had other fellows in there, oh, uh, but uh, out of forty five men, yeah. and uh, their names slipped me for the moment. <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, that's what happened with our Navy, our yeah. Navy, my Navy experience. So we spent three years at St. Mary's College. See, we went in when, when they called us, they, we were all put on temporary leave when they first recruited us. Then when they told us, okay, it's time, then we got on the train, and this is 1945, around October, maybe the 1st of October, yeah. Uh, got on the train Western Pacific and took off for Chicago. Well, there was a jam session going all the way. The guys had their books out and they were having jam sessions on the train because we had a private car. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> it had one compartment in it. That's where the chief stayed. And uh, so <laughs> the guys made so much noise. One day the chief said, okay, no more sessions. No more. <laughs> so, because it was a three-day trip. <laughs> so, yeah. I think after after the about the middle of the second day, <laughs> so we traveled and we uh, we hit Winnemucca. We went to uh, Omaha, uh, Salt Lake City, Denver, and finally we landed in Chicago. So we got off the train in Chicago, and there we are standing on the platform. So. We had to go out to uh, what they called the north side because that's where Great Lakes uh, training uh, mm -hmm. station was. So we were on the, you know, stand on the platform. So then this truck came and took us out to the, uh, uh, the Great Lakes. Now, they had two separate camps, Camp Robert Smalls, that's the black camp, uh -huh. and then the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, that was the white side. So we're they had to wait. We had to wait. I don't know what we had, but we had to wait for something. So we're standing up there in our California clothes, and that wind, you know, that Chicago oh. wind, whoosh, it's worth it. It would go right up your pants leg, you know. So, so anyhow, but, but, but they finally, finally, they, they got us inside, and they, uh, they uh, found a barracks for us, mm -hmm. assigned us uh, bunks and everything, and they didn't have enough bunks. Uh, see, they have some bunks and hammocks. So what they did with me, uh, so, you know, W, I'm way down on the list because they, they, they process you alphabetically. So oh, oh, I see. See, see, they didn't yeah. have any bunks. Okay. So what they did, they said, well, one of our, we've got some of the fellows who are on leave and uh, you can uh, sleep in this fellow's bunk until he comes back. It turned out to be Clark Terry's <laughs> bunk. <laughs> And, 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 but at that, this is 1942, uh -huh. and, you know, he hadn't made a name for himself yeah. and, and we didn't know one another. But when he came back, naturally, I had to give up the bomb. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I mentioned that to him uh, uh, when he was here at, at one of our clubs a few yeah. years back. And I had a picture of that band. I don't know what I did with it, but I had a picture of the band and, and uh, the Great Lakes band. I had yes. a picture of that. I don't know where I got it from, but I got it was a copy. I, I don't know where I got it from, but I uh, I, I I think I gave it to him. Uh, Boy, he, I, that it, name has come up a lot. Yeah. That 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 place near Chicago yeah. where all the servicemen. Yeah. Camp were. Robert Smalls mm -hmm. and their ship's company band was a dynamite band. 
Clark Terry was in it, O.C. Johnson, the drummer was in it, Willie Smith was in it for a short while. He got out, they say he got out on a Section 8, so I guess he, oh, whatever, oh, really? yeah, I guess he, he put on a pretty good act. <laughs> yeah, and from there he went, he went to Charlie Spivak's band, because the white bands were starting to integrate. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the, um, um, uh, you were at Great Lakes, so anyhow, at Great Lakes, um, that's when we, you know, after we got all the uniforms and everything, and then, then the chief, we had to learn how to march in mm -hmm. formation, make your right turn, your left turn, do your right, right about face, you know, and we had a, we, one of our guys, real tall, handsome guy, they made him the, uh, the um, um, band leader, you yeah, know. Yeah, with uh, a baton kind yeah, of. The baton, yeah, baton, yeah. And so uh, uh, they would have, um, they would have happy hours. And when they would have happy hours, you'd have entertainment that would come in. One happy hour, they had the Jimmy Lunsford Orchestra. Oh, my. oh man! And they were they were hot then, you know. 1942, they were hot boy. They had all these wonderful arrangements, you know. And and they were they were a first class band. Willie Smith was in that band along with Gerald Wilson and and uh, oh, Tom Snooky Young maybe. Snooky was in yeah. it. Yeah, uh, Joe Thomas. Oh man, and Jesse Crawford, of course, the drummer, outstanding. So that was one time, and so the um, the commander, the fellow who was in charge of the music program, was Eddie Peabody, the banjo player, and he would during the happy hours he would always perform, and he <laughs> was outstanding. And then, of course, in order, one of the requirements for being released from training was. You had to parade in front of him and do your maneuvers and everything, and you know, and uh, so, uh, uh, and he was, oh, he was a great guy, you know, because he, he was, well, he was a performer, you know, mm -hmm. he wasn't strictly Navy. Yeah. He had been in the in World War One, and so he had been, he was in the reserves. So through the reserves, he just uh, kept increasing his rank. So he he was a commander, mm. and uh, so anyhow, what happened? Our chief. He was trying to get us out of there as soon as possible because the chief from the ship's company band at Great Lakes, he was trying to raid the band. Oh. Or yeah, because you had Ernie yeah. Royal yes. who was on, the, on the, the flying home, high notes. Ernie was noted for high notes, plus he was a fine you know, player. Yeah. Of course, Marshall, and because the fellows would have jam sessions, and the and the other chief would be there watching to see who <laughs> who could do what. So they were trying to raid our band. So our chief, he was old navy. He had a arm full of gold stripes, you know, indicating uh -huh. uh, length of service, gold, you know, not not. Uh, so that meant that he, he was uh, what one A, you know, never had any mm. any any disciplinary problems oh. or anything, and uh, so. Uh, Anyhow, he got us out of there, and then we uh, we came back uh, to California, and on Dece December first, because we spent Thanksgiving there at Great Lakes, we had turkey dinner, and then of course on the train coming back there was no jam session because <laughs> <laughs> we were we were Navy then. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. The, so anyhow, we came back, and uh, we went to uh, went there to St. Mary's, and then. We were lucky because, see, besides being stationed there, you lived off the base. So it, that's one of the reasons, I guess, they recruited us from mm -hmm. this area. So we had, we were given quarters and subsistence. Besides our Navy pay, what was it, $66 a month? Yeah. <laughs> we, they, and they took out $12 for family allowance if you were married. And then they, they, they yeah. took it out and did what with it? Uh, it they added to it. Oh, and oh I sent see. It and sent it to your dependent. So they you, sent twelve dollars a month. Well, they added to it. I think it amounted quarters of subsistence or amounted to around, oh, I think around eighty-seven or eighty or ninety-two dollars a month, something like that. Uh -huh. But see, in nineteen forty-two, for crying out loud, what was the rent? People were paying, oh heck, they weren't paying very much rent. You know, yeah. you might because they had you had uh, price and and wage controls. So that was to, to prevent gouging. Hmm. And so I think I, could, I was living with my in-laws, but then when I got the apartment, I think it was, was it 27.50 a month? Something like that mm -hmm. for, for a one bedroom, <laughs> uh, uh, a duplex. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, we had, so we lived off the base. Yeah. And the fellows that had cars, they would, uh, they would uh, have carpools. 
and based since they had to uh, 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 use the car to get to and from work, where they could get uh, gas coupons. Uh, so what happened? Marshall started organizing the band, putting the band together, and uh, for me, uh, boy, it was uh, it was really something because I had never been in that uh, that uh, fast a company that fast mm -hmm. before. So gradually, gradually I came around. Oh, gradually uh, I started taking lessons from a Herb Sanford. He was one of my teachers. He was an old vaudevillian and played in the uh, dime dances, you know. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, he was the, uh, and he played, uh, he played percussion. He played uh, marimba and the vibraphone mm -hmm. as well. And so uh, anyhow, uh, over a period of time, the band shaped up. And we would, besides playing a dance every Sunday for the cadets, see the uh, the USO would bring hostesses out. They'd recruit them from the universities mm -hmm. and from the different uh, uh, servicemen's uh, uh, you know uh, associations. Uh, they would recruit the young ladies, and they would come out to the to the uh, base, and they had a, uh, a huge drill hall with a beautiful wooden floor. We had a bandstand there, and we would play every Sunday for dances for the uh, cadets. Then we would record once a week for the OWI, Office of War Information, and uh, we would uh, they would set up the telephone. We'd do a remote, and oh. we would remote, and then the uh, the the uh, recording would take place in the city, and then you could come over here to their an office they had down on Sutter and Kearney, and you could go upstairs and listen to the to the playbacks, and they would, they would, these records, they would be broadcast overseas to the 12th Naval District. Were these the V-discs? Uh, they weren't were really, they, they weren't really a v disc because I think the V-discs were smaller. These were large, they were large glass. They ended up large glass discs, and, oh. uh, and uh, we would go down there. We, we recorded, too, for, for another, uh, what was it, the Office of War Information, and something else, some, someone else we recorded for. So we could have done V-Discs, mm -hmm. because that, they were very popular. I know, yeah. I think the, the Glenn Miller Overseas Band, I think they did V-Discs, and uh, so many of the other service bands. But with us, we, it turned out that we were, the, uh, uh, we were considered as a top-rated band in the 12th Naval District, which was a great honor because here you had Artie Shaw was in the South Pacific. He had a band mm -hmm. when he got out, uh, Sam Donahue took it over, uh, and that was uh, Davy Tuff was in that band. It was all full of, full of uh, Los Angeles studio musicians. Yeah. Then the Coast Guard here had an excellent band. Uh, then Pete Rugolo was in the Army band, he had an Army band over here, and Pete Rugolo was their arranger. And uh, where else? Well, they had bands all over the place, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, uh, they picked our band. Now, I don't know why. I, I found out in later years that that our the captain of our station uh, he was somehow related to somebody, one of the admirals uh, here in the tr in the 12th Naval District. So I don't know whether he had the pull or what. But mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, we we always met the challenge. Yeah, every week we'd have uh, at least three three tunes uh, and uh, special arrangements. And uh, also, uh, at that time during the war, this was a uh, this area was one of the greatest areas for dance bands. That Oakland Auditorium, Lionel Hampton used to pull seven thousand people, seventy five hundred people. One of the times in the 40s when Cab Calloway came out to do a picture, uh, I think it was Cabin in the Sky, but he came up to our Golden Gate Theater, because see the band used to do the Golden Gate Theater too, they had, uh, they had uh, vaudeville and they yeah. featured named bands, but uh, this has to do with Cab Calloway and the dance, the fact that this showing how this area was uh, such a marvelous uh, mm -hmm. a draw for dancers. Uh, Cab Calloway did the theater, and then he played the Oakland Auditorium. They had 10,000 people, and the fire department closed the doors. <laughs> and the people were milling around outside. I was one of them, and somebody opened the side door and I slipped in. All right. Yeah. But uh, uh, 
that's what would happen here. Uh, see, before the war, we didn't have that many big bands. You had vaudeville, but the only time you'd really have a big band would be when they came out to make a movie, because see, cause the transportation costs were, were prohibitive, I guess, at that I time. See. So when there would be a picture, then the band would, they would do, come right up, up the coast, coast yeah. up to Seattle, and then, and then back, uh, mm -hmm. back east again. The Glenn Miller Band, they came here. I saw them over at Sweets Ballroom. They uh, did. Uh, they did oh, a couple of pictures here. One was something about Sun Valley. Sun Valley yeah. Serenade or something. Yeah, something. Like, yes. Yeah. And uh, Charlie Barnett's band. I got mm -hmm. to see them. As a matter of fact, Charlie Barnett. He was out here in 1939. So I guess he did a picture then, because he played the old Palomar before the Palladium in Los Angeles, and. Uh, so the Palomar, yeah, Charlie Barnett, and see they used to broadcast. And mm -hmm. I would listen to them on the radio. Artie Shaw's band was there, Buddy Richards with him, and I, I would listen to them. <laughs> then Barnett's band. Now Barnett is closing night. He closed, and Count Basie was supposed to open the, the following week. It would have been the first time a colored band had ever played the Palomar. But Basie was hot, you know. Yeah. He, so what happened? The place caught fire. Yeah. And all of Barnett's instruments were burned in That's his library. Right. And what happened, they came up to Sweet's Ballroom with all brand new instruments, and I don't know where they got the library from or if they played it uh, by ear, but I went to see that band, uh -huh. uh, and of course that's that's kind of like a, hist uh, yeah. a history. And with Basie, now he was in Los Angeles, so they booked him, uh, booked him in some of the places there, and then they brought him up here to uh, perform at our Exposition, they were Exposition 1939 World Exposition at Treasure Island, and I was blessed because I was in and all that. I got to I got to go there and see that. Uh, Benny Goodman came up. By then, Krupa and Harry James had left him, but he had Nick Vitule on drums and Fletcher Henderson was playing piano, and uh, that was a kind of a, a memorable because our show was at the Golden Gate Theater. And Goodman was at Treasure Island, so that meant you taxied between the two. And I don't know how we did it because we didn't have any money in 1939. Mm. Who had any money, mm. <laughs> you know? But we would go, we'd go see Goodman, and then we'd go to the theater because you know Buddy Richards was with him at the time. Yeah. And uh, and even then, Buddy, I on on records, I, Buddy Rich was he really impressed me on records because, you know, of his uh, yeah. fire and and his uh, st uh, solos. I. Uh, I didn't realize at that time there was more to it, to him, than than appeared. He played for the band. He knew just exactly what to play. I don't care what the song was. I don't care what the style was. He had an instinct. But of course, part of it too was exposure, because he grew up in vaudeville, yeah. and he and he used to watch. From what they say. He, he learned from watching all of the vaudeville drummers mm -hmm. throughout the countries. And, and, yeah. and these guys, you know, they had, they had all kind of sound effects because you were, before the talkies, you know, you had to, they had to... Uh, Juggling to, and oh, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, making the, uh, you know, the, the thunder noise when the, on the screen there was a thunder. Oh, right, and right. The, the rain noises. And then, of course, when you had your everything, your juggling acts and your dog acts, see, they had to... <laughs> Do everything with the whistle, whoop, and the and the, the rolls that sounded like paper tearing, you know, mm. really fine uh, symphony style rolls. Yeah. But so rich, but it was in later years I realized uh, that there was he was just more than a noisemaker. Mm. This guy was uh, he knew exactly what the band needed or what the musical occasion mm. called for to play, yeah. and the act he could play any act. Because he was a tap dancer himself, and he had seen all the acts. He had grown up with all the different routines. Uh -huh. uh, but anyhow, so back and forth we were, right. back and forth. So that was the, uh, and with Basie's band, the guys stayed here. So although I didn't get to know them, friends of mine, they got to really got to to, to know the fellows in the Basie mm -hmm. band. Uh, and because we were, I was underage too, because I couldn't go in the nightclubs. Couldn't hang out in the bars yeah. <laughs> or the watering holes. In, but in those was, dance situations, yes. with, um, was the audience different um, for the white bands 
or for the black bands, or was it pretty mixed? In the in the uh, as in the uh, 30s, late 30s, even up to the 40s, before they uh, started uh, in in Oakland at Sweets Ballroom. That's where most of the fellows went because that's where the big bands would make their appearance. The dance halls they had here, they were. Uh, uh, they were more like steady jobs, you know, they were regular, regular uh, Saturday night dances. Some of them ran four or five nights a week. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't cater to minorities, you know, Asians or, uh, or African Americans. No, they, they would, they wouldn't they, let you in. They see. wouldn't let you in. Yeah, yeah, see. And Sweets Ballroom, they had a colored night and a white night. Exactly. Sunday night was white night, Monday night was a colored night. And if you went down there... But was it the same band? Same band. Yeah. When Lunsford's band came through, <laughs> white night, colored night. Basie's band came through, white night and colored night. Um, Glenn Miller's band came through, white night, colored night. Um, Louie came through with a, with a group, colored night, white night. Fat Swaller, Colored Night, White Night. But then when the war came, uh, suddenly the population increased and people were working 24 hours a day. You had three eight-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. So people had plenty of money and uh, they could go out, you know, and uh, uh, they didn't mind if you see, if you had to leave the dance early to go to work with it. But what happened, the, uh, it expanded so in suites uh, with a 2,500-person uh, 2, uh, capacity, mm. they couldn't handle the crowd. So suites turned over the, um, the colored bands to a fellow named John Burton, lived in Berkeley. And John became a, a, a promoter. And so uh, then they started using the Oakland Auditorium. And uh, so then the bands would come to the Oakland Auditorium, and they would they would draw they would draw, like I say Hampton he'd draw seventy five hundred people, mm -hmm. Basie over five thousand, Nat King Cole came in with just the four people, I, I he, the place was packed, wow. um, then, um, I saw who else did I see there at the Oakland Auditorium yeah during the war. Uh, see the um, the uh, USO shows would come here, and many of them had bands mm -hmm. from back east with them. Uh, so that took care of the transportation costs. So when the bands, the show got out here, the bands then the different uh, promoters would book them up and down the coast, and I would go to the Oakland Auditorium. Every time a big band would show up, I'd be right there because when I was a, a teenager, I collected records. Yeah. And so I, I would have all these different records of these different Eastern bands, and this was my chance to see them in person. Mm -hmm. so, I saw, so I saw the Andy Kirk band, and you know, uh, they were that guy, Faye Terrell, the singer, they were, oh man, they were, they were, they were a top flight band. I saw another band at, at the, um, the, um, Persian Gardens, which later became the uh, the uh, Alabama. Uh, I saw uh, the Ernie Fields Band out of Oklahoma. They were mm -hmm. uh, one of the well-known territory bands. Then at, at, at uh, Sweets, of course, as I mentioned before, I saw uh, Lunsford and, and uh, you know Louis and all those fellows, and then and as well as um, uh, Glenn Miller. Then at the uh, Oakland Auditorium. Uh, the Carolina Cotton Pickers, you they you may they may be mentioned somewhere. I've I've seen their yeah. name somewhere in in one of the uh, books on big bands. Okay. Carolina Cotton Pickers, as I mentioned before, the uh, uh, Andy Kirk band with Mary Lou Williams. She was oh playing my. piano at the uh -huh. time, uh, and uh, Ed Thigpen's father, Ben Thigpen. Oh my! He was yeah. a drummer okay. in the band, and Dick uh, Williams. Uh, tenor player, he and Mary Lou Williams were married, and uh, um, oh, um, the guy that Ubi, he and Ubi Blake, 
Noble Sissel. Noble Sissel's yeah. band. Mm -hmm. I can't always slips. They <laughs> they came there. Oh yeah, they were in their tuxes and everything. And uh, of course the Duke's band. I yeah. saw the Duke's band at at the auditorium. And um, so would you be one? Would you be on the dance floor? Or would you be one of those fellas that was like up? That's you know, right. Front row. <laughs> front, front row. row. <laughs> Mouth open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It, yeah. I, I was married at the time. My ex-wife used to. Oh, she used to get up tight. She'd get so mad because she loved to dance. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I'd be either either up front or else on the in the wings, mm -hmm. uh, where I could watch the drummers. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sonny Greer now was the most underrated drummer. He never got any publicity, but he held that band together. He was a burner. I mean, mm -hmm. for, for drums in later years, and I, I you know, I, well, you look for something else. I, I listen to, and if you listen to the records, you'll find he's another fellow that fit that Duke band like a glove. Uh, uh, there's one tune called Cottontail, which is a, which is a classic with Ben Webster. You know, he, he made it really. Right. But if you listen to the drums back there, how he's kicking, and then when the when the band goes, do 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 do, you know, you, you just can mm. listen listen to what he's doing behind the band, and uh, Ernie Royal. Was uh, we were talking about Duke's band one time and and, and talking about the uh, the uh, uh, drummers because uh, they used to talk about Hamp's band. See, uh, uh, as I said before, Marshall and Ernie and uh, uh, Vernon and Irvin Ashby they were all in the first uh, Hamp's band, the first Lionel Hampton band that made Lion home. And Ernie would say, said that. Uh, they always had trouble with drummers because Lionel was Lionel was a drummer, right. and he'd want them to play that heavy bass drum, and he, they'd wear out drummers. So he said that Sonny one time Sonny Greer came in. They had they had to play a show, and their drummer wasn't available. And Sonny Greer came in, and he played the show so great and kicked that band so great that the uh, the owner of the nightclub wanted to hire him on the spot. Well, naturally he couldn't you know, <laughs> because he was a Duke's drummer. Oh boy. Yeah, you don't raid Duke's band, do you? <laughs> oh man, no, no, man. Uh, but anyhow, we had, with that auditorium during during the war, and you had everybody came that came through there. I saw Louis Jordan uh, with his Tempany Five. Mm -hmm. um, oh, who the heck else? Well, I've named off quite a yeah, few. Who's you left? Have, you probably have no way of knowing this, but do you think the bands would uh, change? their song list from the white night to the colored night? Uh, that's a good question. Not going to the white uh, night band. I think they I think they played their recorded hits, whatever their, their yeah. records were. Because with Krupa, he just played everything he played. Well, a lot of it had to do with tempo. See, the dance tempo. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was that. Was that uh, and. Uh, all the bands sounded good. Heck, Vaughn Monroe's band, they came into the T&D Theater and uh, he had an excellent band. You know, it was a, there was a sweet band, sweet, yeah. but it was an excellent band. Uh, Alvino Ray, uh, guitarist, he was with the Horace Height, who was the house band at the Golden Gate Theater for many years. And, and then when that band, Horace Height, split, well, Albino Ray formed his own band. He came up from Los Angeles. He played the TND Theater. They had a good band. Um, just trying to think of the, the other bands that I saw. Well, well let me ask you, yeah. the first time you made money mm -hmm. playing the drums, uh -huh. do you recall that? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I guess it was with the with the Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson played the piano, and uh, he was a good piano player. Mm -hmm. Schooled, you know, in, in theory and harmony, and, and uh, Pat used to get gigs at these after-hour places. So we worked at a place called Minnie's Can Do up on Fillmore Street in the Western Edition. After hours, just piano and drums. And I think I made two bucks. <laughs> and then uh, there was a um, club called the Drum Club, and it was the the, it, the building is still there, but it's under an, another name. Uh, that was right around the corner from the Union. It was on Turk and Jones. And when Saunders King's 
band would get a job, his drummer would take off, and I'd sub for him. Mm -hmm. So that job, I'd get, I think, one or two dollars. And uh, the piano player was Rose Murphy, and I, I was, I'd see her playing, and there would be a quarter, somebody would put a quarter down there. And if I'd turn my head and look back, the quarter was gone. She'd steal the tips. She was an old timer, you know, so, uh, oh, man. Couldn't I, get anything by oh, her, I would guess. No. Yeah, she would, she'd steal the tips. But I said, oh, man, she, uh, but, but, so but I, you were still a teenager, right? I would, yeah, and I had a little part-time job, so, uh -huh. and I, I was just, I wanted to play, you know. Yeah. I didn't, what, what was a, you know, but for her, I guess, you know, the many times you had many performers uh, and band leaders that they were, when it came to the money, they were really tight-fisted, and a lot of times they would exploit their people. Mm -hmm. In fact, you've heard that story yeah, many times. Yeah, I've heard Hamp was a little <laughs> yeah, tight-fisted yeah. with... Yeah, well, it, it was his wife, Gladys Palmer, oh. uh -huh. because she she wouldn't let him have any money because he'd go out on a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> One time, uh, who was with... Uh, oh, yeah, when Curtis was with the band, one of the times he said that uh, they were always after Gladys. said, Gladys, it's embarrassing. We go out to a, a nightclub after we finish our dance engagement and, and Hamp orders up and, and he doesn't have any money to pay for it. He said, geez, you, 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 you got to give him an allowance or something. So one day, Hamp then got a hold of one of the recording checks. And he didn't. He disappeared for three days. And when he came back, he was wearing the same clothes. <laughs> he, he had gone out on a three-day drunk. So Gladys said to him, "Now you see why I don't give him any money." <laughs> so that's that's the story Curtis told. This is Curtis who low. Uh, Curtis, yeah, oh, Curtis. the baritone player. Yes, I am. yeah, that's. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, with Lionel, yeah, they were that. That was a. Uh, Band. They, they, they always, the musicians loved to come to San Francisco. So he would come here and do the Golden Gate Theater, do their show there. He would do that. Oh man, that was, he was a regular there. And the men loved to come to San Francisco because we had one of the highest theater scales. Oh. Yes. So when they'd come here, they'd be downtown buying socks, underwear, <laughs> shirts. <laughs> <laughs> because the other, when they were on the road, they didn't make very much. Right. Now, uh, Quincy Jones, in his uh, autobiography, he mentions his stint with Lionel, and he said they were making fifteen dollars a night. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I've forgotten the year he mentioned, but yeah. uh, that wasn't very much money. <laughs> right, and sometimes you'd have to pay, f you know, well, you did your own food. You, you did. You, you, you paid your own hotel. Your own, in your own restaurant, yeah, you know, there was... <laughs> I guess you have to want to play awful bad. Hey, well, it's, music is like any, like so many forms of art. It's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. so, and, and the music business, you talk about uh, being addictive. It's as addictive as any narcotic. Well, you know, once you start playing, and if, especially if, if you're playing with guys that can play and 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 you you get a, a certain co cohesiveness and a certain satisfaction, and then the people, the audience, you 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 bring so much joy to them, uh, husband and wife or girlfriend and boyfriend or fiancés, they'll come out and and maybe that that's a very memorable night to them. Maybe mm -hmm. you play their favorite song, and uh, well they'll tell you what their song is, and they go home with a pocket full of memories. And if you're lucky enough to uh, uh, have a CD or, or a recording, a tape or something, they can take it home with them. See, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it, it's just, and without without music and the arts, your culture has no soul. No soul. As a matter of fact, you don't have any culture, you know. So uh, there's uh, just a whole lot that uh, yeah. goes with it. and. So you make the you just make the sacrifice, right. and uh, I've been blessed because uh, in the mid '60s, when rhythm and blues and rock and roll, when well, the early '60s when it started pushing us out, mm -hmm. uh, why and our jazz club started to fold, well, I went to work for the union, 1965. So I got a job uh, with the union, uh, and so. At least I could, I could pay my rent and everything, so then I could uh, afford to be a casual musician. So, mm -hmm. so I did casual work, worked on the weekends, and uh, then uh, I got 
most of my jobs, I was lucky. They were long-term jobs. The Vernon Alley, I worked with Vernon Alley. He was the uh, the uh, house uh, band leader for the Black Hawk. Black Hawk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I worked with Vernon because we had been in the Navy together. I worked with them, I guess, maybe three or four years. Then when, when they started cutting back, I got got with Father Hine, well, Scobie. Went with Scobie for a year and uh, got the Dixieland experience and then when Father Hines came here, the guy at the club hangover hired me to replace the drummer. I guess Hines was unhappy with the drummer, uh, so that was that. In, that lasted the association lasted seven and a half years. Yeah. So then, uh, after that, then that's that was sixty three, sixty four. I worked with Slim Jenkins. I worked down the Mars Club in uh, San Jose, and then in Early '64, uh, Wilbert Barranco hired me to work two nights a week at the Claremont Hotel. He was doing mm -hmm. five nights a week, and and he was up there for for I was up there seven years with him. It's interesting because he's the first fellow you recorded with, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Well, we're in the Navy, right? And, uh, and also in the uh, mid '40s after the war, Wilbert went to Los Angeles. See, because he had he had lived there before, and he knew uh, he knew all the musicians down there. Mm -hmm. He knew all the guys in the union. Uh, Curtis Mosby, uh, you'll see his name in the annals of the big band annals. Uh, uh, Wilbert had been on the road with him, uh, back in the, I guess the early '30s. Anyhow, uh, Wilbert went to Los Angeles. And he was, you know, as I said, he was not only was he a fine pianist, but he was a fine arranger. So Wilbert. He got in down there, he was working, he had a gig, a noontime gig, piano single, a cocktail session gig, and an evening gig single, and then he was arranging, he was writing, he was just selling his arrangements. And he got a recording contract with Black and White. He got a date. And this is 1946, and he called me up from Los Angeles and asked me to come down there and do that date with him. So I, I hustled myself down to Los Angeles. I was working uh, at the band box in Menlo Park at the time with Buddy Collette and uh, Ernie Royal and a fellow named Jimmy Shorter, pianist. We had a quartet. So I got a Bobby Osbend to sub for me, and I went down to Los Angeles. and. Uh, we had to go out to the studio. I was out in Santa Monica, and I went to the studio, and here you have Dizzy Gillespie, Howard McGee, Carl George, and and another fellow. I I, I can't remember the fourth trumpet player. Then the trombonist, trombones. I can't remember their names. Willie Smith on lead alto. <laughs> Lucky Thompson on tenor. Then uh, I can't remember the rest of the saxophone section. Uh, Mingus on the bass. Oh my! <laughs> and there <laughs> I am sitting up there. <laughs> and so we did. We did several tunes for Black and White. And I understand now that uh, that some company in England, I guess, bought up the masters. And uh, someone told me that they saw in one of the magazines this uh, this uh, Wilbert Branco recording with Dizzy on it. And uh, because I never got copies of them, oh, never even heard them. Never heard them. No, uh -uh. but uh, <laughs> well, wouldn't that be interesting uh -huh. now to hear it? So it week? was a, it was a wonderful <laughs> experience. And when Buddy Collette and Ernie eventually they went back to Los Angeles. See, mm -hmm. we all worked after the war. Well, we I got a job in late night in the late forty five, just as uh, I was getting out of service. I got a job. For uh, in at the band box in uh, Menlo Park, working for Maury Waxman. Now Maury had had a club in San Francisco during the war uh, called the International House. It was located on Columbus, just across from uh, the Barbary Coast, what you call the Barbary Coast. That was Pacific Avenue, and uh, it was down in the basement. Sawdust on the floor, big barrels for tables, small barrels for chairs, <laughs> and they had a big bandstand. And uh, I was in uniform, and I worked there for him. And uh, I used to do the extended drum solos and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I must have worked for him for six months. 
and we weren't supposed to, you know, because uh, the, no. the, the union had an agreement with the 12th Naval District that the union musicians wouldn't compete with local musicians. But there weren't a lot enough local musicians to fill all these jobs because you had you had all if you look in our chronicle now you see or you see all these little clubs well that's what we had during the war every little spot had something in it mm -hmm. piano piano and drums piano and bass piano uh, <laughs> drums and guitar every little spot all the north beach chinatown uh, uh, up and down market street the barbary coast was was wall to wall on each side of the street uh, uh, clubs, bars and clubs. Mm. And uh, so uh, I got that job down there playing and uh, it, re it was good for me because uh, I had the chance to work out these extended drum solos which later I, I, I during my course at, uh, at St. Mary's College because what I'd do, I, you could hitchhike then, you didn't have to worry about transportation so I'd hitchhike over to the the International House and do our set. We played nine till two. Then I'd hitchhike home. Then I'd get up in the morning and, and we'd go out to St. Mary's and we'd practice all day <laughs> and oh, do our I... duties, our musical duties all day. So it was that was quite a period. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, Maury Waxman, yeah, he um, after the war he moved down. He went down to the peninsula and opened up this spot and he hired us. We worked there for a year. I had Buddy Collette and Ernie Royal, and as I said, Jimmy Shorty. So that job, uh, Buddy Collette was the first one to go back to Los Angeles, and I got Curtis Lowe to play in tenor to take his place. Then after a year, see that, so Curtis, he must have come in. Buddy was there for, for most of the engagement. I think maybe the last two months Curtis played. And then I got uh, Jimmy Shorter, also he left. Jimmy Shorter was, uh, he was a railway mail clerk back in uh, Washington, D.C. He was one of the first that they had, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so he had uh, taken the military leave, so he said, well, it's time for me to go back. So I got Ali Mishaw, who had been the drummer for Scatman. Scatman Crothers? Scatman Crothers, <laughs> yeah. So an, an excellent pianist. So I got him, and so that association lasted, well, let's see, we played See, as I said, Buddy was the first one to leave, and then uh, Jimmy Shorter, he went back to Washington, D.C. Er, uh, Buddy went back to Los Angeles. So that was Ernie and Curtis and Ollie and I, and we got a job. We left there, and we got a job at the uh, Slim Jenkins in Oakland. That's, uh, uh, he was uh, quite the guy. The place was in West Oakland at that time. And it was a cabaret, I mean, it, uh -huh. first class. What would you hear your song list have consisted of then? Kinds of tunes? Oh, we would do uh, bebop then. We were beboppers. Oh. We'd do Now is the Time and, uh, and, uh, and uh, oh, just uh, the bird and jazz tunes. Really? And then, of course, then as, as time went on, we'd, end, we'd do ballads and uh, we'd do standards. And if there was, when we went to Jenkins, he had singers. We backed singers. Uh -huh. So whatever the singer had, we'd back it. And then, uh, of course, since singing started to become popular, so we would try to do some of the Nat King Cole things that he did at the time. Right. Straighten up and fly right, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we'd do, a, uh, oh wait, well, we it was a, var a mixed variety. Right. And uh, so then, while we were at Jenkins, um, we looked up in the audience and there was this guy the trumpet in his hand, he came by and said, geez, you guys, I sure like what you do. Geez, you sure like what you do. So it turned out to be Kenny Durham. Oh. His parents had sent him out here to clean up, you know, because he was a... Uh, That's very interesting. I wanted to ask you uh, something you briefly touched on before. Mm -hmm. We were talking about rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, you know, musical styles and what's uh, popular changes a lot, but do you remember specifically what it felt like for jazz-based musicians around here when rock and roll started to take over? Well, you know, the, the, we've already had 
controversies, you know, with the musicians. The moldy figs against the beboppers. What did Louis say when he, when yeah. he was saying, you right. know? Right. So the, the always, there was always a controversy. I mean, uh, uh, even if you, if you read history of, of, in New Orleans, uh, how uh, the music, uh, there was, uh, seemed to be controversies. You mm -hmm. had the different schools as, I guess, each age has its, uh, it's a, uh, it's musical. Uh, what they have musical culture, musical right. taste. What they, they're fad or whatever you want to call it. Um, so when I'm speaking for myself, I came up in the big band era. Then when bebop came in, I was just fascinated with it. Just absolutely fascinated with it. The improvisation, with the the tempos, the the um, soloists, the independence that the drummers had, and all, all just, uh, it was just fascinating. So then the, um, the, um, we, we tolerated Dixieland, because you know, it was, we gave it, gave it its due, it gave it the credit, because uh, it's improvisation, it's mm -hmm. just mainly improvisation. They have their, the songs and their routines, but then in the meantime, the soloists, they improvise. Yeah. And a guy like Sidney Bechet was way ahead of himself. You know, who knows? Uh, Bird might, uh, part, he might uh, have taken from uh, Bechet because he was a bad cat. But, uh, uh, okay, so you respect that. You listen to it. Uh, but then the doo-wop came in. All these singing groups. Well, the kids, the young kids, with disposable income, suddenly there was all of this money because the uh, the um, uh, the veterans, the veterans then, and the war workers, well mainly veterans, they were going to school, they were going to, they were buying homes, raising families, and suddenly this surplus income, there was you know the money started to uh, get tight. And here comes the young kids with their music, and suddenly the club owners, you know, the business is falling off. So some of them were jumping on the bandwagon. As a matter of fact, they in in the, uh, uh, in the mid '60s, I know they were when I went to work at the Oakland office. They um, would have concerts some of these promoters, they would promote a concert on the weekend. They'd have a, a garage band, and they'd draw eight, nine hundred kids. Well, they'd pay the guys, what, five men, four men, pay them fifty, seventy-five dollars, not a piece, total. <laughs> and they, if they charged a dollar on the door, and they got eight hundred kids, see, the, uh, I know yeah. over at the, uh, uh, Lake, uh, the Lake Merritt Hotel, no, not Lake Merritt, no, the uh, own, it wasn't a Lake Merritt because they didn't have the uh, public dances there. There's the Leamington Hotel in Oakland. They mm -hmm. had a ballroom, and they uh, the, the guys would promote dances. And we used to get calls from the management. Uh, uh, we'd like to know if you could tell us the band that played there. Uh, our microphone disappeared, or our PA system, part of our PA system <laughs> is missing. Well, these are all non-union groups, kids' oh. groups, so you oh. know, they, we didn't, had no way of knowing, but that was, then the Claremont Hotel up there, they decided, uh, they got a young man, and they gave him license to uh, have concerts up there for the kids, mm -hmm. and they would draw, same thing, eight, nine hundred thousand people. And, but the kids, were, they were kind of rowdy, you know, the, uh -huh. the cars in the park that were parked, yeah. the cars would get trashed, and, and they were just rowdy, uh -huh. and the guests complained, so they stopped that after a while. But in the meantime, that, they were, that's non-union activity, so that means that the union musicians don't get to gig. Right. And uh, then Bill Graham, oh, he sure. came to town, and he started promoting over at the uh, uh, Fillmore Auditorium. And uh, then, so he would do the same thing. He'd have a garage band. He'd have a, 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 name, a lesser name right. plus a garage band. 
yeah, you know, seventy-five dollars. After all, man, you're getting a chance for exposure. Oh, and right. Exposure. This job is going to lead to so and so. But then he'd have a semi name, and then later he moved over to Winterland. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, yeah, and uh, uh, then he started because they had a larger capacity. Right. And then and he became he became really big. Yeah. And of course he opened up the thing down at. Uh, I guess it's Shoreline does. That's sure, wherever that is down in Mountain View. That's really a big thing. But uh, what it did, the club owners then suddenly they wanted uh, singing groups, and then uh, then they wanted then with the rock and roll. You know, you had you'd have uh, uh, you'd have the two guitars, right. bass, bass, electric bass, drums. And if they had a tenor player, you'd have a guy, you know, they have a tenor player sometimes. Yeah. And what they would play, it was a very, very loud, very, very loud music with a, a harmonics, very simple harmonic yeah. structure, maybe three chords. So the club owners, they just started hiring singing groups and, and yeah. those the rhythm and blues and rock and roll groups. And it just for jazz, it just just pushed us out of the picture. And many of the big bands, they just banded. You yeah. know. Even Duke's band, there was an exodus out of his band with Johnny Hodges, Lawrence Brown, and all those guys. Yeah. And they, they, they were, I think Norman, they went out with Norman Grants. Uh, they had a Castle Rock. They had a hit record called right. Castle Rock. Right. See, but they had left him. They, they, that band, they played the, uh, the Black Hawk. Sonny Greer wasn't with them, but uh, the Lawrence Brown and, and uh -huh. uh, uh, Hodges, and I think Rudy, Rudy Williams was on clarinet. Yeah, clarinet, and I didn't, uh, I don't know the bass player and drummer and piano, but the, um, uh, the, it's it just, uh, and, and Basie, remember Basie had the small group? Sure, he had a small group yeah. in the 50s. Yeah, Clark Terry and Wardell yeah. and uh, Buddy DeFranco yeah. and uh, Sam Jones, I oh. think, on bass. I think Jimmy Lewis played. Oh, Jimmy that. Lewis, I beg yeah. your pardon. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Lewis. And uh, bass, of course, and Gus Johnson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they played at the um, Champagne Supper Club uh, uh, here in San Francisco, small group. Right. So that's what it did with us. Uh, the big bands, it just, they, right. they had to uh, reduce. Woody Herman was out with a small group. Mm -hmm. Buddy Rich was out with a quintet. In uh, 60, when we were in Chicago, he was playing in the room under our hotel, the Cloisters. We stayed at the Maryland Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a room on, called the Cloisters. Buddy Rich came in. Uh, Miles, he played at the, oh, he was at the um, Bird House, but they stayed at the hotel. Uh, one that, and they, uh, uh, Rashan, Roland Kirk, yeah. they used to lead him around with all these horns <laughs> around his neck before, in 1960 before he, he made the big time. Oh. But uh, uh, that's what happened small yeah. groups, right. small groups. And even even the singing groups, they had to lobby Congress to reduce that uh, twenty percent entertainment tax. Because if they were singing, they can tenor, then you had to pay entertainment tax. That was wartime tax. They taxed all entertainment. See, if there was singing, they didn't yeah, have to pay. You did. You did. Did yes. So uh, they finally got the Congress to cut it. They cut it five percent off. Then they took another five percent off. Mm. And I, I don't know when they, uh, if I don't have, if they ever completely eliminate it, or you still have to pay a percentage. Right. But uh, that was also a deterrent, see, because uh, you, uh, you couldn't, um, if a, uh, if the guy wanted to have jazz and the singers, so he could get both crowds, mm. then that that uh, tax would kill him. Oh boy. Yeah. So yeah. that's. Uh, I hope it answered your question. Well, yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I guess it would be hardest on the all the horn players who, yeah that's right you know because a rhythm section player could choose to say well all right i'm gonna play with a doo-wop yes group. that's but right the horn players were like yeah they don't even have the opportunity mm -hmm. well if you notice like trombonists and mm. and the trumpets see saxophones sure uh, right. they could uh, you know play the tenor lay on their back <laughs> and, and walk the stuff. bar and all sure. this uh, stuff yeah <laughs> Uh, so it, it was really detrimental, and uh, and I just 
I just ignored him. I didn't even listen. Like all those, mm. all those tunes from the, from the, uh, the doo-wop tunes. The good tunes too. I can enjoy them now. But then they just, re there was a, they were just pushing us out of work. Yeah. So I just, as far as I was concerned, and then some of them they didn't, they didn't do the right chords or melody line. <laughs> there was one group that sang, uh, "I've told every little star." Just how sweet I think you are. Why haven't I told you? Then on the bridge, they completely screwed it up. They changed the bridge. So I guess they didn't know it. Because, you know, many times uh, uh, people, if, especially if you're playing by ear, you, the bridge is difficult. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you get that middle part right. and say, uh oh. <laughs> but that was just one of the things. And, and, and you'd listen to them and they say, oh my God, they're mutilating the melody. The chord changes are so basic, mm -hmm. and after you're listening to, you know, you're listening to, what, to Oscar Peterson and right. uh, and uh, uh, Bud Powell and and all these, all you know, Wynton Kelly. You listen to all these guys and Shearing, oh, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so the, it's, it seems so simple, so right. simplistic, you know, and um, then when they when they started uh, the Beatles, now the Beatles. When you study their music, they're something else. Mm -hmm. They've got standards out. They've got tunes that you can play for anybody. Michelle. Yeah. Yesterday. Da, 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 da. Beautiful. You know? Norwegian Wood. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Uh, but then there's a lot of these other groups. I mean, it's, you know, but they, what they have the mile high amplifiers right. and the roar of sound that mm. practically knocks you over so you know and they're prancing on the stage yeah. and even breaking up instruments on right. the stage and right. all so uh, it uh, it if, if depending on your musicianship you know if, if the more you know the tougher it is to uh, yeah. <laughs> to go along right. but then it makes money sure see and and your promoters see the promoters uh, uh, they could do more for jazz because jazz is our American classical music. See, but we can't get the support. We can't get the financial support that uh, the European classical music gets, or that uh, the um, oh the things like the Rolling Stones and all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they draw when they they go. Out, they draw such huge crowds, and the tickets cost a bundle. Mm -hmm. But see, we can't get that kind of support. You know, yeah. you can you can have a small following, people that come in, they right. enjoy what you do, and uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had uh, earlier on before we were actually mm -hmm. rolling, mm -hmm. you had told me um, about the integration of the musicians' union. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure integration is the right word, but Merge. merging yeah. and. Uh, it's a fascinating story, and if you don't mind uh, repeating it. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. As a matter of fact, I have some documentation that I can I can get to you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Curtis Lowe, who was assistant to our secretary treasurer, he, they commissioned him to document it, mm -hmm. and he wrote a very, very nice uh, documentation. It, it gives the local number of the first local, first black local, and then he goes into the merger, and he very well put. He mm -hmm. doesn't call names and stuff, you know, or yeah, or uh, yeah. But we, um, as I was saying before, see, when I joined in 1937, uh, the uh, African American and black musicians, we had to join a subsidiary local. You got a card, local six, but subsidiary across it. So that meant that you didn't have access to the building. Uh, you didn't have access to, well, any of the services, but you were bound to observe their wage scale and working conditions. You had no vote in the election, and you had no, um, no representation on any of the committees, the wage scale committee, any of the committees, but, uh, and as a matter of fact, at first when I joined, we used to meet at the home of this, our secretary treasurer business agent. He had a, a room well, uh, let me backtrack. When I first joined, we met in Oakland at the Elks. But then 
It was when we were when we became chartered in uh, 1945 at 669. Then we met at the Secretary Treasurer's business office. I mean, his home. He had a room mm -hmm. downstairs. But yeah, we met we met in Oakland at the the Elks. It was a Black Elks over there, and um, the jobs. We had a business agent. We had a uh, we had a president. We had a secretary, well, secretary, the treasurer, business agent. He was all the same, secretary, treasurer, business agent. So we had an official family, and we had we didn't have we didn't have a board of directors. I don't think. No, I don't think we had a board of directors in '45 when we became chartered. At six six nine, we had a board of directors. But anyhow, um, as I was saying, you had no say, and also. Your employment was restricted. The uh, in San Francisco, uh, anything uh, east of uh, Divisadero, people wouldn't hire you. See, they wouldn't hire. The club owners wouldn't hire. And I told you that story about the um, the Dawn Club and Wilbert Barranco. And now uh, that's the story that he told me. See, he was in directly involved. And uh, now there were some isolated incidents. Uh, uh, very isolated uh, engagements where black musicians were hired. Uh, Eddie Alley, Vernon's brother, told me a story. He worked at a place on Pacific Avenue, and it was gangster-owned. And so they told the union, the union reps, you leave this band alone. You know, oh. I want this band, and this is my club. So, <laughs> so Eddie, he, he worked down on Pacific Avenue, so that had to be in the, in the very early 30s. And then, uh, of course, prior to that, see, if you go back into the history of uh, San Francisco and, and, uh, and, and, and we had, when we had Barbary Coast, the Barbary Coast was integrated. They had colored bands, you had colored entertainers, that was all up down on Broadway and, and the Pacific Avenue. Uh, there's a book. Uh, there's a book uh, uh, written by a guy, Jim Goggin, and uh, uh, Sid Leprati is the name of the pianist that he uh, is mainly featured. As a matter of fact, it's about Sid's uh, history. Mm -hmm. And Sid, oh, it's a marvelous book because it gives you the history going back to the, what do they call it, the Texas Trot or something. The, the different dances oh. that they did uh -huh. and, uh, and what they used to do on, uh, in the Barbary Coast and the different, and they were all colored bands. Uh, Kid Ori was even, he was out here in, mm -hmm. in the uh, early 20s. And I think Hines was out here, oh, he was out here in the, in the 20s, I think the mid 20s, before he became band leader at the Grand Terrace in Chicago. He was out here. Uh, but uh, they um, uh, see so so, but then I don't know whether it was the depression and uh, but the uh, uh, the city uh, we always had kind of like uh, there was always there was there was racial segregation at all times against the Chinese uh, against the uh, Japanese against the colored the most restaurants wouldn't serve you. Uh, with us, if we wanted to go to a restaurant, you went to a Japanese restaurant. If you wanted a hotel room, you went to a Japanese hotel. See, because they, yeah, they would take care of you. And, uh, and, uh, um, I, and in Chinatown, you'd go there, and they'd tell you, well, you have to have a reservation. Unless it was a slow night. If there was nobody in the place, oh. then they'd let you in. Oh my! They put you in the corner and put a screen around you. Get out! Yeah, I, I, oh. I experienced that. That's not just hearsay. I ex that's my was my experience. Is that right? Yeah. And another experience uh, during World War II, I was playing at the Stage Door Canteen. Our St. Mary's band, Frazier Scott, one of our trombonists, and I, we went out for a beer on intermission, and we went to this little. It was a look like a pattern after a cable car, a little bar, to get a beer on the intermission. In our uniforms, the uniform of our country, the bartender said, if you want a drink, you'll have to go out in the Fillmore. I said, well, I'd, I'd like to see the manager, please. Well, the manager was trying to sneak out. 
Mm -hmm. So we, we got and nailed him and said, you, we're in, here in the uniform of our country and you won't serve us. Well, well, oh, he stammered and stuttered anyhow, we walked out. But uh, mm -hmm. we had, there was a lot of, uh, uh, th this mm -hmm. town, it wasn't, uh, you know, I guess it was maybe after the gold rush or I don't know when, when the, the, um, the color bar maybe got to be broader. <laughs> but uh, I can remember and my experiences, you know, even as a kid, um, um, they opened a miniature golf course on Fillmore and Sutter, right in the Fillmore, right in the middle of the Western Edition where most of the colored people live. Yeah. Miniature golf. And they wouldn't sell tickets to colored. Yeah. That's, I mean, <laughs> in San from moralistic, of course, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's terrible, but from an huh? economic standpoint, it just seems silly. Well, Why would they open it in the Western District, mm -hmm. as you said? Yeah. Well, see, we were all, the, the area was, see, we were our minorities. Uh, we were in a minority. The uh, black presence and the, and the Ch uh, Japanese presence, we were very small, uh -huh. see, because you had Russian, French, Irish. Irish mainly were out in the um, Mission District, but you had all this, you had all kind of races here, and uh, Caucasian. Uh, and uh, so we were in a very, very small minority. So mm -hmm. I guess they, they either, either they figured uh, they would miss it or else they figured maybe the, the white community might resent it. I don't know what the psychology was or the yeah. thinking was behind it. But uh, uh, that was a, uh, a thing. But, but see, so the same thing, uh, it, it, uh, after the Barbary Coast, because when, when I read the history of the Barbary Coast, and I read about all these musicians that worked there, and then uh, they worked, they worked the dance halls on Market Street. They worked downtown Oakland in the dance halls. Now, this is in the 20s. See, the, and they worked, and then suddenly, in the 30s, everything's closed to black mm -hmm. musicians. And so I don't know, I haven't, uh, I guess I haven't read enough about when it came about or why, but, but I, I just know that uh, when I joined the union, uh, you were restricted. Downtown Oakland, Oakland had a business agent in that office uh, before I got there, and he, and boy, he was, uh, he'd do his best to keep uh, the black musicians from working anywhere in downtown Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and over here, the same thing. We had a fellow named Eddie Burns, and, and they would prowl, and, uh, and uh, over North Beach, uh, he was Italian, Burns was his uh, stage name, but uh, they, they had great influence even though I went to school with Italians. So over there at, at Galileo High School, the student body was largely Italian, but uh, uh, they just didn't hire you. Um, so when uh, this thing happened uh, with the union, it mm -hmm. was in 46, oh, yeah. was it? Uh, the, our merger. Yeah. Yeah, we merged. Now, uh, yeah, where I, where I was, I drifted once again. Uh, I first started out talking about the the black local, yeah. and I told you the story about the merger, and then I joined in 37, and I was subsidiary. Well, um, as I think I mentioned before, in, in 45 or the or mid 40s, Petrillo abolished the subsidiary locals, because you had subsidiary locals all throughout the United mm -hmm. States. You had also black chartered locals. Many of them, the charters went back to the early 1900s, made some even the late 1800s. I mean, Chicago, uh, uh, 10, 208, so I guess 208 was a black local. Uh, see, when they merged, many of them took the dual numbers. Number. Yeah, oh. 10, 208, that's the merger, they merged. But anyhow, um, uh, 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 Petrillo abolished the subsidiaries, and then as I, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we asked, uh, they were, um, the Federation then gave the uh, locals the choice of accepting the subsidiaries as full members, parent local they call it, or uh, failing that, why, that's how we came to have the charter of 669. So in 669 we set up, had a, our office, we had a president, we had the um, secretary, treasurer, business agent, and we had uh, and, a, and then we had another office secretary. We had we had a board of directors, and I was I was on the board of directors. I got elected to the board of directors, and uh, 
So in the um, we we asked them all, on numerous occasions about amalgamation merger. Even one time we got it on their ballot through uh, uh, white friends, but uh, it was defeated. So then, as I said before, the state of California, it's it's in the documentation I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and uh, so anyhow, after we merged, Pop Kennedy was president at the time. Uh, that was in 1960. And Pop Kennedy then, he proceeded to try to accommodate us as best he could, considering that there was a resentment from, mm -hmm. yeah, you had a hard core. So he appointed me to committees. I was on the Way Skill Committee, I was on the Music Performance Trust Fund Committee. I, for five years I served on committees. Then a, an opening occurred in the Oakland branch office. They had this branch office that's been over there, I guess, since the earthquake. And so he put me in there, and that's when I uh, got my taste of our musical bureaucracy. <laughs> and uh, uh, by then, too, your um, uh, rock bands were really starting to flourish in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. They were really starting to flourish. And uh, over there, then we had clubs opening over there in Oakland, and uh, uh, they would, oh man, they'd have, you know, just had <laughs> these rock bands with all that noise. Oh my God. I would, I would, we'd be playing at the Claremont Hotel. That's when I was with Barranco. That was uh, in, 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 during the same time I was working at the Union. We'd be working in the lounge. Well, up over the lounge was what they called the terrace room. Mm -hmm. This was in the Claremont Hotel. So they'd rent out the terrace room to a prom. Terrace room accommodated uh -huh. about 800 people. And we're down below here yeah. in the lounge. All of a sudden, crash, bam, thump, thump, noise. And the waitresses would go up there and ask them, could they please be quiet because they're disturbing the patients below. These kids would be up there, kids, well, we can't feel it if we, if we don't play loud. So <laughs> it was just terrible. But anyhow, what happened, uh, getting back to the, the union situation, so I worked in the Oakland office and then I got to uh, uh, learning about, uh, well I learned, you know, I had to do wage scales and all, the, and, and all sorts of different, give service to the members and yeah. collect the union dues and do the banking, oh I had, it was, you know, for coming out of a jazz band. Oh. <laughs> when, the, when the merger happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was it a positive thing immediately or at all? Well, uh, yes, in one, on one hand, it was positive. The 49er band, they got integrated because the 49ers, uh, our football team, yeah. they were playing at Keysar Stadium then. Mm -hmm. That was out in the park. And uh, they had a 40-piece band, so the band became inter integrated. Um, and then, of course, by then, by 1960, um, uh, many of the clubs, like the Black Hawk, they, they were hiring traveling bands plus local bands, and many of the clubs, they hired uh, uh, mixed bands. Okay. Uh, um, in a way, you know, you you figured with the the our sec uh, Al Forbes, the secretary treasurer business agent, the one that took my five bucks and two dollars <laughs> when, yeah. when could he could he could catch me. That was his dream because integration, you know, even under Martin Luther King, integration. They figured that would be the that was the greater good, you know. But for us, well, we lost our our representation. We lost our, our official family. Our president, secretary, treasurer, business agent, uh, the board of directors, that all went by the wayside. Mm -hmm. see. Uh, also, we lost our representation at the American Federation of Musicians oh. conference, the right. conference they give every year, the uh, convention. So in that way, uh, you, you lost representation and, and uh, uh, We've never been able to integrate the symphony. They've had, uh, they have Asians, they have, uh, you know, uh, but uh, 
we don't have any black people, any African American in our symphony. Uh, the ballet, we had a marvelous conductor, Dennis D. Coteau, but he passed away. Um, the ballet orchestra, well, we, uh, we had Elaine Jones on timpani. She was in the symphony for a mm -hmm. very short while, but then they claimed that she didn't, uh, her probationary period, they claimed that she wasn't qualified. Now, here's a lady, she had gone to Juilliard. She would played all over Europe, and she played in the symphony, so they, they uh, wouldn't uh, uh, let her get the, the, the probationary period. So um, uh, Kurt uh, Adler from the opera orchestra, he took her into the opera orchestra. So mm -hmm. she played in the opera orchestra for years. And she's gone, she went somewhere, I don't know where she went, whether she went back east or whether no. she went over to Europe. But uh, uh, she was in the, the uh, and it's fine timpanist, fine. But see, timpani player, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a high paid job oh. in percussion because you have all the doubles. So you play, right. you have all these doubles and each double means a little more money. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, anyhow, um, it's it's hard to tell because we also um, see we lost uh, when the redevelopment came along. We lost a lot of our black clubs, mm -hmm. the employment that we had in in the black uh, establishments, uh, cabarets and nightclubs. Uh, there was one time out in the Fillmore where you had a place called The Scene, you had Black Shears Cafe Society, The Favorite Club, the um, uh, Booker T. Washington Hotel, the California Theater Club, the Plantation, the New Orleans Swing Club, which later became the Champagne Supper Club, the Booker T. Washington Hotel, the Blue Mirror, the Ebony Plaza, then you had Bob City, the after hours spot, Jackson's Nook after hours, another place on McAllister after hours. I don't know what the name of it was, but I went in there one night and Wes Montgomery's in there with his group. Mm. Then, uh, see the re redevelopment, they destroyed all those. Yeah. They just wiped them out. So we lost, we lost that employment, see, and that was primarily black. Mm. Every now and then they'd have a mixed band. Yeah. But, uh, uh, we, so, I don't, I've been lucky, see, I can't complain, because I've been very lucky, because uh, I work with Scooby, I work with Heinz, and then, then the different groups I work with, uh, my engagements were long-time engagements. Yeah. Uh, here, the one I'm on now, at Scott Seafood Restaurant in Jackman and Square in Oakland, I've been on that job for Sunday, Sunday morning since 1986. Wow. Yeah, and uh, from that we get Casuals, weddings and banquets right. and birthdays and all sorts of retirements, you name it, see. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's I've been lucky, but some of our musicians weren't so lucky. So yeah, because you had some that specialized, you know, they specialize in certain type of mm -hmm. music. They, uh, uh, that's why I say I'm lucky, because I was, I've been able to adapt to whatever right. the occasion calls for. Right. <laughs> well, you've just about done it all. Well, I've been lucky. Yeah. Just blessed, blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then uh, many times I get a break, the drummers would come in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Shelly, Shelly Mann, uh, Max came in. Uh, by then, I had left. I was with Father Hines, and I went down on the jam session, mm -hmm. uh, to, or I went down on the performance night to see Max, you know, because, hell, he was... He was the man, and a fellow named George Morrow was playing bass with him. Well, George Morrow, we had played together with the Jerome Richardson Quartet. See, Jerome Richardson's quartet, uh, see, they started cutting back at the Blackhawk. That was in the, around 1953. And so um, they would just hire me just for Sundays only. I see or when a name came in and they wanted to augment the band. Maybe it was 52, 53. So uh, I went to work with, with Jerome. Mm. Jerome Richardson, uh, he, was a, he had a little quartet and he was struggling, so he'd get three or four nights, maybe or here, right. or three or four nights there. So uh, with Jerome, 
We played a place called The Village in Richmond, and we had George Morrow and Jerome and uh, Cedric Haywood mm -hmm. on piano. Well, you and I have something in common then. What's that? Uh, two summers ago, I recorded an album and Jerome Richardson played on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. What a guy. That was before he passed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Might it, have been three summers now that I come yeah. to think of it, but they had a memorial for him in New York, yeah. and they had one here. Uh -huh. And uh, who should show up? Jackie Kelson showed oh, up. The Basie Band was laying over preparatory to going oh. to Japan, so Jack Kelson he came in, and uh, uh, Jerry Dodgen. Oh yeah, he, he was in man. town with the, with that uh, band from New York, uh, the Carnegie Hall. Right. Yeah, they were they were doing Concord, so he he, he played at the. Uh, Jerome's memorial, hmm. but uh, um, anyhow, getting back to this quartet, so we we played the village, and then we came over here to San Francisco, and we played. That was the Diamond Knee, when, with Krupa. Mm -hmm. That was with the Jerome Richardson Quartet, and then we played at a place called the Cable Car Village. That's just at the foot of Knob Hill on California Street, uh, and uh, so we played opposite. They were bringing in different groups. So we played opposite the Ink Spots. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Oh, what a good gig. And, wow. and then they brought in Ella Mae Morris. Mm. And we backed her. And she loved the band because I knew all of her records. Yeah. All of her records. That's so and great. Sure. When you're listening to yeah. those records as a kid. Cow, cow, boogie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, well, then from there we went to the, uh, to the uh, Champagne Supper Club down on, in the Western Edition. And... So Heinz came through, Jerome didn't tell anybody, but Heinz came through at the hangover and his saxophone, and when he left, Jerome left with him. Mm. And so I went to work the uh, second week on the Champagne Supper Club and there was another band on the bandstand. Wow. Jerome had split town, wow. hadn't told anybody. So uh, anyhow, that was my experience with the Jerome Richardson Quartet. It was a good quartet too. Jerome arranged, he did the arranging and the singing. Yeah, he was he was extremely talented. Yeah, he pl and he played he played like the oddball horns. He could play bassoon, oboe, mm. English horn. Yeah, he learned them all at uh, at the State Teachers College. Right, because in our Navy band he played the uh, oboe, and he taught he, he taught uh, this fellow Jimmy Shore that I mentioned, the pianist from Washington mm -hmm. D.C. He taught him how to play the bassoon. Cool. Yeah, the double reed instrument. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Watkins, yeah, this has dip. been fascinating. <laughs> oh. I think we're going to wrap up here, oh, and uh, we probably, next time I come to town, we could do part two. And oh. <laughs> All right. It's so, really been amazing. Uh, oh, well, you know, uh, I have a tendency to drift. Uh, That's okay. You gave me lots of great stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe when you edit the tape, maybe you, you might get you might move get things some, around a little bit. Yeah, you might get some good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for oh, your time. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>